Good. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, if you were here earlier, you would have heard my colleague Andy talking about Aston Technology, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. You can look, look us up if you're interested. In, if you're interested. Um, but I'm going to be talking about something different to what most of the people in the room today have been talking about, and that's the, the QGIS graphical modeler. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about a project that um, Aston's been doing, which is a bit out of the ordinary in terms of the, the kind of work that we're doing, or we're, we're doing a bit more of this, this kind of work. Um, and it's working with an organization in the UK called Ramblers. Uh, so for those of you not, who are not familiar with it, basically it's the, it's the walking organization in the UK. It's people that, that go out and walk. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very large, active membership organization. It's a non-profit. And as well as um, having an interest in, in um, you know, the, the state of, of paths and, um, and, and the people that use them, it's also very active in, in um, lobbying for improved access to the countryside and basically for getting people outdoors. So it's got a great kind of mission and, as I say, very active membership. So um, they came to us and, and asked us to do some work on an analysis of access to the rights of way network. So there's a rights of way network in the UK um, where anybody can go and walk. It's, it's uh, data which is maintained and published by local authorities. Um, and they wanted to know, you know who, was, who was able to access that, how easy it was for people to get access to it. Because their, their, their suspicion was, their hypothesis was, that you know, it wasn't enough people and it wasn't necessarily the, the right people. Uh, so they wanted some evidence to, to back this up. So they commissioned a research project involving us and a uh, uh, research organization, New Economics Foundation, and, um, and got, us to, um, uh, got us to have a look at it. And we, we did the kind of data crunching, and the research organization did the, the analysis and, and wrote a 43-page report. Um, so, um, so my talk's about the graphical modeler, and I was in bed with... Um, up with QGIS, in bed with um, just COVID um, a few weeks ago, and I was lying in bed, kind of, you know, thinking about various things, and I thought, wouldn't it be a good idea, if, because I'm talking about the graphical modeler, maybe I could do my talk using the graphical modeler to model the process of my talk. So that's what I'm doing today. This, um, it may or may not work. Um, you'll be able to tell me at the end. It, it will maybe work better. I did one a few years ago using the, um, I did a presentation using QGIS Atlas, and um, that was sort of vaguely interesting. So we'll see how this one goes. Maybe next time I'll use the expression builder or something like that. So here's my, here's my talk. And, and what we're going to be focusing on uh, is the data that we were looking at, paths, access, different types of, of landscape, um, and, and essentially where it is in relation to the population of the UK. Uh, that, was the, that was the analysis. So a uh, relatively limited number of, of data sets, but quite a lot of different questions that we, that we had to answer. And these were the kind of questions that we were, that we were asked. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of them in, in detail, but it was about you know, what within, each, within a buffer of each postcode, so the UK zip codes, uh, which are areas, I guess, average of about 40, 50 people live, um, what was there in terms of rights of way within 800 meters, 600 meters, uh, 3,000 meters, and so on. Um, and then what was the quality of those rights of way? What was wild, what was green, what was forest, what was near rivers, and so on and so forth. So there was quite a bit of digging in terms of, um, of um, uh, you know, those sort of questions, and also quite a lot of interaction to try and tie down not just the questions they wanted answers to, but what questions it was going to be possible to, to answer because they're dependent on data availability and, and they had a limited budget and we needed to focus on the quick wins that we could do stuff with in, um, within the time allocated. So we, um, we, we, this is the list of questions we came up with in, in the end. This is um, New Economics Foundation, as I say, this is the organization who did all the sort of clever stuff at the end uh, involving looking at all these stats and, and boiling them down into something that could be made into policy recommendations. Um, 
So that report is still in draft, actually. It's not been published yet, but I think it's going to be published pretty soon. So the timing is good. Um, keep an eye out for that if that's something you're interested in. Um, so we came up with a, a list of, of models, and we, and we um, essentially went through and d developed a model for, for each of those questions. Um, just a quick show of hands, by the way. Um, uh, how many of you have, have worked with graphical modeling in a, in a reasonably serious way? Um, okay, so that's interesting. So that's about half. It's interesting. I mean, I, I don't see that much about it, but um, it's uh, so. So I think it's a sort of slightly under. I don't know if it's underused, but it's um, not something that tends to get a lot, a lot of publicity. But it's a. You know, my conclusion, jumping to the end, is that it's a. It's a really solid tool and it was actually essential for this work. So why did, why did we use it for this, for this work? Well, uh, I mean, I work with QGIS a lot, so if I'm asked to do some work, it tends to be my first port of call is to look for, for whether there's something in QGIS I can use. Um, I can write SQL, I can hack a bit of Python, but actually I'm much more comfortable sitting in front of QGIS and, and pressing buttons. So if we can find something that allows me to do that, then that's that's a win as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the other reason it's a win is because ramblers are, are keen to ramp up their own GIS capability. Um, you know, they've got a lot of smart people. Uh, they're very capable. They've, they've got limited experience of the kind of tools that we're, we're using, but they're very keen to learn. So, so the other st strong factor in terms of using the QGIS modeler was that at the end of the day, we wouldn't just be producing a, a, a bunch of um, statistics and walking away. We'd have something that we could hand over to, um, to ramblers in terms of something they could use in the future so that they could feed different data sets into it so that they could look at it in a year's time and see what had changed in the period since we produced our figures. So um, you know, this transferability uh, factor was, was very important to us and important to them. So um, we looked at this, uh, these models. I'm not going to go into all of them in detail, but I thought I'd focus in on, on one of them in particular. And this was about, um, there's a category of land in the UK called, um, called open access land, which is what it sounds like. You know, you can go onto it and you can have your picnic and wander around and so on. Uh, and they were keen to know, um, first of all, what was the length of rights of way within open access land? That's fairly straightforward, you, you would probably think. Um, but also the, the extent to which open access land actually connected with the rights of way network because open access fine, uh, land is all very well and good but if you can't actually get to it easily then it's not so useful and they had a suspicion that there was quite a lot of open access land which actually wasn't connected or was too small to be very useful. So that was the other question they asked us. Uh, and then the, the, the final question, so it's a sort of three-part question, this one really, uh, was um, uh, you know, from every postcode in the, in the country, or at least in England and Wales, how far is it to your nearest bit of open access land? How far do you have to travel along um, using the rights of way network in order to get to a bit of open access land? So there were, there were three parts to that question. And for each of these questions, you know, we had to go through a process of saying, OK, this is what we think we want to know. We'd say, OK, well, we think in order to find that out, this is what we're going to have to work through. And, and we'd reach a point where we'd agree. And quite often, we'd produce some data and we'd say, no, I don't think that's quite right. So it's very much an iterative process. But this was what it, what it boiled down to. Um, so um, just to give you a bit of context on the data, um, about 50,000 um, 50,000 lines was, is our rights of way network data. Um, it, it was actually quite hard to get hold of, but that's another story. We can, if anybody's interested, I can talk to them about that, um, even though it's, it's maintained by local authorities in the UK. Uh, and it represents, I think, something like 200,000 kilometers of rights of way, the rights of way network in the, in the UK. Uh, we have these open access areas of about 14,000 polygons and then one and a half million postcodes covering again um, England and Wales. So there's some quite chunky data in there and, and as we will see, you know, processing and performance was one of the issues we, we came up against and had to, uh, had to, had to grapple with. Um, 
So I'm going to ask for a bit more um, audience participation at this point. So having given you, which I'm sure you all remember in detail, having told you about that question, I'd just be interested to know how many processes, how many individual processes in a QGIS workflow people think that that might involve. So hands up for less than five. Okay, hands up for six to ten. Handful, hands up for 11 to 15. And over 15. Okay, so the answer is 15. So you're pretty good. You're a, you're, you're a smart audience, I mean, as if I didn't know. Um, but yeah, it was more than I thought, to be honest, um, because you end up having to do things that you know, are not really, you wouldn't think of as being processes when you design a process. You know, there are processes, and then there are processes you have to do in order to make the processes work or work better or to tidy things up. So, yeah, there were a lot of processes, and it turned out to be you know, a slightly more complex workflow than, than I thought. So, um, we've, uh, we've, we've done that, and um, I was unable to, to catch anybody out. So, um, what I wanted to do, though, was not to... to to take you through the whole workflow, because that would take probably an hour or so, but you know, here's, a, here's a screenshot of the workflow overall. Most of the 15 processes are, are in there. If you've used Graphical Modeler, you'll be familiar with that kind of graphic. Just to focus in on a few of the things that um, maybe were unanticipated or, or um, uh, we needed to, to tweak. So things like um, simplifying data. We found performance was throughout was an issue. You know, we had some processes which were taking 24 hours to run. Uh, which was a bit of a pain. Um, you know, it wasn't a tight deadline project, but you know, when something runs for 24 hours, you sort of forget about it and get, start doing something else, and it takes you another half hour to work out what you were trying to do in the first place. So we needed to speed things up. Simplifying our polygons made a big difference because we realized it wasn't really important. You know, we're not interested in the detail of the boundary of each polygon. It's not going to make any difference to our answers. So you know, we could simplify to quite a reasonable extent not lose any quality in our output and gain a loss on performance. So things like that we, were useful. Um, we found we had to do quite a lot of sort of pulling things apart and putting them back again. So turning things from polygons into lines and then linking them up with our polygons in order because we needed the area of the polygon to, to, to do our final anal analysis. So we needed to add IDs, for example, because we were producing data sets as part of the process which didn't have IDs, so we needed to give them IDs so that we could get back to them and find out what their, their area was. Um, spatial indices, you know, any of us who've worked with spatial data knows that spatial indices make a vast difference to how quickly our, our data work. QGIS helpfully usually tells you if it's got a, you know, if you're running a process which is, is not very fast. So, um, you know, I, I found that we were adding spatial indices maybe two or three times during a process because every time you produce a new output, you think, oh, well, I've already got a spatial index on that because you don't because you're creating a new output which needs a new spatial index. So you need to drop in a spatial index. I mean, it's very quick. It doesn't really take much in the way of processing time. Um, and then we did this thing in order to... One of the things I mentioned... Um, that they were interested in was the intersections, you know, the, the, the degree to which these um, areas intersected with um, uh, the, the rights of way. So, you know, how many points did you have to get into this rights of way? And, it, it, and unless somebody can tell me different, the only way I could find of doing that was doing a, you had to turn the polygons into lines in order to get the intersections between lines and lines. So I turned the polygons into lines and, did, and then run a, pro, a, ran, ran a the QGIS process, which identifies those intersections, and then I had to link back up to the polygons to get the, you know, because it's the polygons that I was interested in. So there's a bit of sort of around the houses to get, um, you know, specific, the counting intersections bit of that of this process was probably the one that, that um, you know, needed the most thinking about and needed the most sort of experimentation. Um, and the rest of it, as you can see, is 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 running these parallel processes and then putting things back together again at the end. And all that works pretty well. Um, 
you know, once you've once you've kind of worked out your your uh, your process and the things that you need to do, it all it all runs. So, um, what what do we learn from that, and what what are my conclusions? Well, you know, I mean, I have to start off by saying that the the graphical modeler is a very useful to me, very useful and very solid kit bit of kit. You know, it didn't fail. Uh, it didn't fall over. There was, you know, I absolutely can't fault its its robustness. Um, there are things which is quite a learning curve in some parts of it, and there are things that I like kind of discovered at the end that I wish I'd discovered at the beginning. But um, that was a failing on my part rather than anything else. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it is a very as a workflow tool. It was absolutely right for the job. Um, specifically. Um, it's got useful things like you can deactivate parts of the model, so if you don't want to run the whole thing, you can turn bits on and off. That's something I found out quite early on, happily, so I was able to sort of run subsets of the model. Um, I learned that it's good to generate the intermediate outputs. Don't just rely on getting your final output um, and then working with that, because you'll probably find along the way that something's gone wrong. If you've got all your intermediate outputs in memory, you can go back and kind of trace through and see where it's gone wrong. Even if it's not, I'm not talking about errors in the processing. I'm just talking about where you, you know, didn't didn't do something right, so it, it, you don't get the answer you wanted. Um, there's some general comments on on documentation. You can document processes. You can document your inputs. You can put comments on stuff. You can see them in the in the map here. Really useful. Do that as you go, because you know tomorrow next week you won't remember quite why you put in that process. So just put a few notes in, and you can also document at the model level. The model help is really useful. You can put the model metadata. You can put an overall description. You can describe your inputs and outputs. Again, you know we all know this about documentation. Most of us don't do it, but document as you go along, um, because it's much harder to do it at the end when you've forgotten why you did something. Um, the, and the graphic is um, uh, the graphic itself is useful, you know, just as a communication tool to, to explain to somebody else what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, particularly people that aren't used to working with this sort of this sort of data. Um, there is a whole load of issues around around processing time and working with big data sets. That's inevitable. Spatial indices. Um, and and uh, th that's one. Another was I. There was one model where I kept producing these outputs uh, until I realized that they were, they were outputs we were never going to change. You know, it's like pre-processing. So when I finally tweaked onto that process run a lot quicker, I just produced them once, and then they became my inputs. So um, you know, that was worth, worth uh, reminding myself about, really. Um, you can do things like clean up in, uh, there's a retain fields process, which I came across in, in QGIS, so you can clean up stuff that you don't want, because you end, if you join stuff together, you end up with loads and loads of, of spurious attributes, probably three different versions of area or something, so you can scrub all those, get, only retain the ones that you want. Um, and you've got SQL as a backup in, um, if you need it. The progress bar is probably the, 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 one of the things that is sort of least reliable in, in the graphical modeler, because the progress bar works out progress on the basis of the number of processes. So if 80% of your processing is in the last 20% um, of your, um, uh, your, your processes, uh, it's not going to give you an accurate re representation of where you are. But you know, progress bars are progress bars. We know all about those. Um, what else did I wish we'd done? Um, you know, apart from all those things, um, I had the idea I kind of like the idea of packaging everything, so I like I save my model in the project, and I save the project in a geo package, and everything sort of Russian doll like. And then I realise that actually it's not so great in terms of transferability because it's better to keep them separate as separate model entities, because then I mean it's easy enough to fix, but um, you know I got a bit carried away with trying to sort of keep everything nicely packaged, whereas actually you know make a model, it's a standalone. Um, artifact, keep it standalone. It's much easier then to find it, get at it. Don't risk losing it if something terrible happens to your project. Keep it as a standalone file. Um, there was a few things, you know, with the processing toolbox, everybody who's used it knows there's loads of stuff in there that you just keep coming across. So I found right at the end of the project a whole set of 
tools called modeler tools. I thought, okay, that's maybe something I should have looked at earlier. Whoops. Um, and um, anyway, so I know next time I'm looking forward to using the modeler tools next time I use the modeler. Maybe other people have used them, I don't know. Um, so I've nearly finished. What else? The logs, there's a lot in the logs. They tell you everything that's going on. They tell you the timing. So again, don't just ignore the logs and move on. It's worth, worth having a look at them. So um, just, to, just to throw out you a few of the things that came out of this draft report, you know, what they say is, based on all this evidence, um, public rights of provision is deeply unequal. Probably not surprising, but you know, it's, it's evidence-backed now. We've got this evidence. We've done this analysis. Residents of the least deprived areas have got 80% more right-of-way provision than people in the most deprived areas. So there's this massive inequality. You know, largely it's about where people live, I guess, and urban and rural and so on. But uh, there are health indications. There are, you know, all sorts of other indications. This is just a few sort of random, random quotes I pulled out from the report. So it's really nice to be what involved in, you know, what our operations there, which I like to call a real GIS project. Apologies to all, you know, everybody else who does, you know, and we all do real GIS, but, you know, to actually work through and, and take publicly available data, it's all publicly available data, and produce this kind of evidence is quite satisfying. And QGIS graphical model, it turned out, was the, the tool for the job, so we were, we were very happy with it. Yeah, thank you.